Well, you got yeah, yeah. You can be in charge of the handouts here. Okay. Well, right, let me get a few things out here. And uh, I hope we're not preaching to the choir. No, the choir. How many people are on the 10 gigahertz band right now? Raise your hand, Mickey. <laughs> now, right now, she's sitting here. Uh, 25%. Good. Well, we have 75% to convince, right? I had one of those old icons that you got there. Did you? Oh, yeah, that was quite a while ago. How stable is that? Oh, another live one. Not too bad. Lots of seats. It's not too bad. Up front. Don't be shy. No, no, no. It wasn't synthesized. It's a, it's a crystal VXO, variable crystal oscillator with a capacitor. And so it, it, the crystal actually tunes a couple hundred kilohertz at the two meter band or close to it. And you have to have 200 KC band segments. So you need crystal, different crystals. So one crystal will go from 144.0 to 146.0 and so on. So that's about all you can get out of a crystal. In fact, that's quite a bit. Well, I guess uh, you can hear us. Chip and I, how long have we known each other? 50 plus wow. years? Probably close to half a century. I'd say at least a half a century. We're old. We're old. And we, old. I don't young. say you look it. So anyways, we kind of met on the air, I think, in the VHF contest or something. And uh, Chip was in southern Vermont, I think, and I was, I forget where I was. I, was, I, I grew up in the area in Henniker and Concord and so on. So several years ago, we decided we were going to do a Chip and Dale Award. This is a copy of the Chippendale. This is a very rare thing. Not too many people have these. Probably because... I'll pass this. This is a copy. And you know, it, it definitely says sample. So you can't it, cheat. And it's either that not too many people have, it think it's a valuable thing or there's just not many people know about it. But <laughs> we didn't want to make it so easy that anybody could get one, but you also didn't want to make it so that nobody could get one. So in order to get the award, you have to work both chip and myself on six bands each. Doesn't matter what they are. They could be HF, VHF, or some combination. Could even be light for all I care. And I will write down the bands and the date. I don't need the QSL cards. The bands and the date on the award, and they're numbered. We've only given out about a dozen of these things. Uh, so anyways, if you like to collect wallpaper, this is your chance to get another award to shingle your shack with. Um, Chip and I often are on Tuesday and or Thursday on 80 meters. So you can get a hold of us then. We have a net at 9.30 to 10. I usually don't check in till a quarter of 10 or 10 minutes of 10. Very informal, bunch of VHF people. So if you have 80 meters, the frequency is 38.60. Tuesday, 9.30 to 10, or Thursday, sometimes neither, sometimes both. And if you get a hold of us, we might be convinced to work us on some other HF band that you can do. But you're most likely to catch us in VHF contests and where else? Any place. Chip's a real good DXer, so you might run into him. So there's the award. Uh, so I made a handout. I left a few things off, but that's okay. Um, I see this band, this 10 gigahertz band, is an important one for us to hang on to. What we're doing is a drop in the bucket because the band is 500 megahertz wide. It's got more spectrum than all of the VHF and UHF bands put together. Uh, but how many people actually use it? Not too many. And uh, what we do is we use a very small part of that 500 megahertz, probably less than 100 KC out of it. So that's not very much. And uh, as Fred said, I think the future to hanging on these bands is going to be a lot of digital stuff and things that the average ham is going to be able to do every day and not just a few times a year that we do contests. Well, that said, I got into this stuff, um, probably, probably you did at the same time, in the late 70s, early 80s? Uh, I think for me it was the 80s, mid-80s. Yeah. And... Uh, I started out with these things called gun plexers, and Chip uh, and some of the guys in Vermont were using the radar detectors. So why don't you talk about those for a minute? 
Yeah, and in fact, that's I, I, I'll just break in here. You, that's yours, right? Yeah. And that, this thing is, believe it or not, and I, I'm just because if you're operating with a gun plexer and it's full duplex, so there's no over to you or back to you or anything. It's just like a telephone. So naturally, I had to. For me, I had to use a telephone handset. This is kind of faded. It says, "Do not, do not." De- Discuss classified material. The KGB may be listening. <laughs> the Cold War. The Cold War. It's an easy way to get started. And back when you and I started, there was some pretty basic equipment available. It cost a little bit of money, but yeah. it's commercially available. Little horn. In fact, you know what? I think. Let me just pass this around. By the way, it's a horn. This thing is plastic with aluminum coating. Long before 3D printing. If you have access to a 3D printer, you'd probably make your own. Well, in fact, I think Jay Rusgrove, who had the Advanced Receiver Research Company, had a whole bunch of these for sale. And they like five expensive. bucks at yeah. the flea market. He was trying to sell them off. So if you want to get one of these horns. Se- seven, 17 dB gain. So it's got a heck of a lot of gain. And <laughs> I, I don't know what your best DX is, but mine. Mine was you. Thing here. Oh. Now, mind you, it's wideband FM. It's pretty much line of sight. So, you know, you need to be on a mountaintop if you want to work someone. I think my best DX was 125 or 200 miles. It, it was working uh, me. Washington to uh, like Wachusett. Wachusett. I was on Wachusett. I took a gun plexer. I couldn't work I'm it. I'm going to send that around. It was you too can, far. So I put, it's got a little end I put the on dish on, on it. Instead of the horn, I switched over to the dish and put the gun plexer on that. And we were able to talk on FM. Uh, I think it's 127 miles, if I'm not it's mistaken. It's a little over 100, 120 something miles. 127, I think, and it's 230 something kilometers. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the path. If there's a line of sight, there's no fading really, except for a big rainstorm or something. That's what can do it. You know, if you want 100% reliability, it's going to be pretty. We ran diversity for the utility company on microwave stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot of there's a lot to that topic. Anyways, uh, around the late '70s, Jim Fisk from Ham Radio Magazine, who, if you remember Ham Radio Magazine, which is no longer around, and Jim Fisk, by the way, passed away of a heart attack when he was 45. He was a gung ho kind of guy. He wanted to promote microwaves, and he gave a talk at one of our VHF conferences that was started in the late '70s uh, about getting on some of these bands. So I don't know the politics behind it, but somehow he got together with Microwave Associates. Dana Atchley was the chairman of the board, and uh, they decided to make a ham product out of a commercial radar thing. And I kind of got involved in the project because I helped to promote it. So the unit was nicknamed the Gun Plexer because it was using a gun, G-U-N-N, diode. I think John Gunn was the inventor of the diode, and it's in a cavity. So I'm going to pass this around. That's what's in, this one's a gun plexer. The one that Trip has, that's, is that a gun plexer? Or a radio? Yeah, that's a real gun plexer. That's there. a full gun plexer. It's, By the way, <laughs> if, if you want to do this on the cheap and you want to do hmm? FM, which not many people are doing. I can't do that. And Chip, what's inside You can that either one? spend some money on a gun plexer or find somebody that works on, you, you know when you go into these big box stores and the door <laughs> opens up and you don't touch anything? The little 10, 10 or 11 gigahertz system that detects your motion and opens the door. You could ask her. This says bad gun. Is it soul fan or something? It's, soul, it's part soul. of a soul fan, but that's the. <coughs> the only problem is they're not tunable. Yeah. So they're fixed frequency. Yeah. You know, this is a. This is just a feed horn. It's not. There's no. There's no. There's no radio in there. They, they. They. They can be used as long as somebody on the other end has something that's tunable, because they're fixed. Yeah. You, you gotta. You gotta put it in the ham band if it isn't there. I, well, someone told me that. They yeah, they probably are. I'll send this one yeah. around. Yeah, well, we had a lot of fun with this there's stuff. The, there's um, the gun, and that, that this one is tunable, oh, very cool. which is handy. Now, the gun plexer has three diodes in it. The first one is the oscillating diode called the gun diode, and that typically put out 10 or 15 milliwatts, although you could spend more money and get the high-powered 50 milliwatt version. The other diode was called a varactor diode. A varactor is like a tuning capacitor that you put voltage across it to change the capacitance, and that actually changes the resonance of the cavity. 
So you could tune by putting a DC voltage with a 10 turn potentiometer, you could move the thing up or down. Typically we covered 10.28 gigahertz or 10.25 gigahertz, those two frequencies. How uh, stable They're stable enough for the purpose that we use them for. They're not that stable. They're wide, it's like wideband FM. They would probably drift a kilohertz, a megahertz or two, which would be unthinkable for weak signal work, but for this stuff it was good because you're dealing with signals that are a few hundred kilohertz wide, so you could find each other and they'd stay. So you'd, you could actually lock them on to a, and there's a whole book on the subject, by the way, called the Gunplexer Cookbook, in which if you can find that in print, it tells you all kinds of schemes for sending television pictures and voice and all sorts of stuff. So anyways, Chip and I would, go out, we'd have a contest every year to do this kind of stuff. Why a contest? Because you don't just get on this frequency and call CQ and hope to work somebody. <laughs> you can, <laughs> It'd be depends, very lonely. depending how crazy you are. But a contest, the main point of a contest is it concentrates activity. It's a goal that people shoot for. They get on a certain weekend, you know, and, and make contacts and I welcome. You know, give them a handout. Give them a hand and then a handout. There's some handouts right here. All right, I'm going to grab one. So, anyways, the gun plexer would turn out to be a neat thing. And the third diode in there is a detector for the receiver. So one of the gun oscillator was oscillating at say at 10.25 gigahertz, which is 10,500 megahertz, or 10 billion 500,000 500 million cycles per second. And the second gun flexor is at 10.28. They're 30 megahertz apart from each other. So if you connect a 30 megahertz intermediate frequency wideband FM receiver to one of the gun flexors, its oscillator will beat with the incoming frequency that's 30 megahertz difference and produce a signal at 30 megahertz that you can hear on the receiver. So the two units you work are offset from each other. And they can be listening to themselves as well as the other station. That's what the duplex means. You can talk and listen simultaneously. It's like a telephone. It's actually kind of neat and it sounds really, really good. Why don't we use these all the time? Because they're short range. They're very good for personal communications or links or television. You can send wideband, perfectly nice television pictures. This book tells you how to do it. This, so back in the 80s, we were doing all this kind of stuff. And uh, for my work in helping to promote them, the uh, Dana Ashley from Microwave Associates actually gave me one of the units. I made the mistake of not asking for a second one because you need two. So I went and bought the other one. But anyways, you can, they're, they're a lot of fun, they still are. And uh, I've still got a bunch of these things. In fact, I made a high powered gun plexer. I put a one watt amplifier following it. And people would say, you're loud. <laughs> The problem is I was, you know what an alligator is? All mouth, no ears. People would hear me and I wouldn't hear them because, you know, I got, I got a watt instead of 10 milliwatts. That's a lot. Uh, but we had a lot of fun. Do you, do you still use your gun plexers? What, gun plexers? Yeah, or any other stuff. I, yeah, that, and by the way, that one is a full gun. That's gun a real gun plexer with a receiver, right? Yeah. The only problem with the wideband FM and why we're not using it, as Dale has said, the range is pretty much line of sight. If there's trees in the way, it gets kind of a yeah, challenge. Yeah, yeah, It doesn't, it, because it's wideband and so on, it doesn't hear signals as weak as some of the later things. Well, in the 80s, they started developing, as Fred said in the last talk, commercial stuff. And some of it was uh, gas FETs, or gallium arsenide field effect transistors for television. You know, microwave TV. So these devices and mimics or microwave integrated circuits became available in the 80s. So now instead of getting 10 milliwatts with an oscillating diode, you could get a lot more power and you could make narrow band equipment. But it was more expensive, but your range was considerably extended and things have progressed. Now, Mickey and I enjoy the 10 gigahertz stuff a lot because we combine it with travel and going to islands and all kinds of stuff like that and chip is the same way we we like to go out we like outdoor things so this sort of turned out to be a really neat thing in fact i regard this as 
some of the most fun that I have in ham radio. To do there this are stuff. ways to save money, and I'm going to send this around because some of you may have seen these. Yeah. In fact, they usually show up here at yeah. the ham fest. Oh, oh, yeah. The beauty of if you're on the narrow band part, as Dale said, is stuff is becoming available. And if you have to go commercial, and I'll send this around in a minute, it can be expensive. But we're hams, right? We yeah. improvise, we scrounge. And we're cheap. And one of the things a lot of us are doing, <laughs> this thing it came out of a TVRO receiver, you know, the little ones that you want to get your TV signals from a satellite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're available for well, five, ten bucks or so. This says noise figure 1.2 dB. That's, that's pretty good. That's, that's really pretty good. good. That's very good. And I, I the, the first narrow band sideband CW 10 gig system I had, I built it basically from scratch. Yeah, from I remember scratch. helping you with that. You helped me with it. Yeah. And there's the receiver. So you, I'll pass that around so no, that's you can see a, that's one a of very, these. That's the a high market. gain television preamplifier with a low noise figure. That's a really good preamp. And the now dishes, it happens to have a waveguide yeah. front end, but you, right. there's you ways can, you can adapt for that. Right. And if anybody wants to get into this, I have a, a bunch of satellite TV dishes, 18 inches. So you can get free antennas. You just have to promise you get on the band. That's all. Price is right. Price is right. By the way, this is a gun flexor. If you remember Ham Radio magazine, this was featured. This very unit was on the cover of the magazine. And uh, before power poles, we all used binding posts. Uh, this is a complete 30 megahertz receiver and a gun flexor and so on. And I got it calibration so you can use the turns counter dial to get the voltage on the Veractor right and so on. So uh, we've made a lot of contacts. My best DX is working chip, like we say, from Mount Washington to uh, Wach uh, Wachusett. And I, and I did it by putting a dish at my end instead of the horn. Horn to horn, you can go, what, 40 miles maybe? Uh, 40 or 50 miles. Something Thank like you. that. Beyond that... Yeah, and yeah. One, it's 127 miles, I think, or 200 and something kilometers. I think the one I did, and I, <laughs> I, I can't remember, it was one of your friends, I think, that I worked. I had an 18-inch dish. Yeah. Again, surplus. I found it for probably five or ten bucks, and I think he was using a horn. Probably was. So, fast forward. Uh, I got a diode mixer and, a, and an oscillator. Now we went to transverters. A transverter is a transmit-receive converter. And it converts one frequency to another. It's a heterodyne thing. It mixes two frequencies. And the frequency of choice now for the weak signal stuff is 10,368 megahertz, or 10.368 gigahertz. Why that frequency? It's harmonically related to some of the other microwave bands, like 1296 and 3456, which we no longer, no longer have, and so on. And uh, so they try to make these frequencies harmonically related so you can find each other. You gotta remember, this band goes from 10.0 to 10.5 gigahertz, and we're only in one little tiny part, 10.368. Higher frequency than the gun plexers. Is that frequency that you're in typical of people that are doing this? In the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world, but that's true. We try to, in fact, we try to uh, center it right around there so that most people that I know use a 144 megahertz, a two meter radio. So 144 megahertz on your dial, like this old ICOM 202, is 10368.0. And uh, 144.200 is 10368 .200. So they sort of standardize that 10368 Point one hundred would be where we'd sort of hang out, and I try to move lower than that, and W1GHZ tries to move higher than that, so we don't, believe it or not, interfere with each other. Uh, so it's a very narrow part of the of the whole thing, and you can't just find each other randomly. And if you try to tune into something like that with a gun plexer, the drift would make the signal unreadable. We're trying to read down to cycles now instead of hundreds of kilohertz. So how do you get extended range with this equipment. The bandwidth is narrowed. And if you could narrow the bandwidth by a factor of 100, if you go, say, from 200 kilohertz bandwidth to 2 kilohertz bandwidth, you can get a sideband signal through, but the noise goes down by a factor of 100, 20 dB. You can hear a 20 dB weaker signal from that alone. 
And with the new uh, field effect transistors, we can up our power and run more than 10 milliwatts. When I started out with the sideband stuff, I just had a diode mixer with a tenth of a milliwatt, and I was working further than I could with a gun flexor. That was an eye-opener. So I pursued it, and transverters became available. There was an English kit called G4DDK, and uh, I incorporated one of those into uh, one of my uh, homemade rigs, which is right here. And I put a one watt amplifier. I don't know if I want to pass this around. I'll just leave it here so you can look at it because it's sort of delicate. Got a homemade preamplifier. It's got a fancy filter because you remember you're, you're mixing a crystal oscillator multiplied 96 times because they don't make crystals at 10 gigs. But they do make them around 100 megahertz overtones, and at 96 times, it comes out at 10,224. And if you add 10,224 to 144 megahertz on your two meters, you get 10,368, which we want. You can also get 10,224 minus 144. You don't want that. It's called the image frequency. You see, you filter it out. Here's the filter. So there's all this fancy stuff. There's a relay, and I put a surplus tuned one watt amplifier while following it. That put me in the big leagues. So there's my, it's full of dust from the corroded uh, rubber in the little case here. I'm going to leave I'll, this I'll here. pass mine around for you. Now Dale does it one. the hard way. He pretty I'm much made. builds things from scratch, with scratch, without scratch. Not totally. If that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, but I will pass around this other one. This is another one. I got this military surplus case. I said, I'm going to build a transverter in that. And this is a homemade uh, uh, 10 gig rig, which I used to put up on my tower before a contest. I'd hang it up with shoestring and put a bag over it. And I'd have it up behind a dish like that, up 40 feet. And, uh, and it's homemade. It puts out about three quarters of a watt. I think Mickey used this thing once or twice. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i send this around. Send now, I, around. I did it the easy way. I just wrote a lot of checks and use my credit it. card. Just don't drop it. <laughs> this. The, the long anymore. narrow thing is the 10 gigahertz <laughs> transverter. 144 megahertz goes in, 10 gigahertz comes out at about 100 milliwatts. You could use it by itself, and you could yeah. certainly make contacts with a. No, that's a DB6 NT. DB6 NT. It's yeah. German. Then I went and bought a DL uh, DL 2, 2 AM, I think. Yeah, he made the power amp. It's a five watt amplifier, and there's a little. Fancy preamplifier. Yeah, you got a nice setup. And a relay. Yeah. And the, the hardest part, some of you here may be old enough to remember Tetris. Remember the computer game where you had to match things? And well, this was my Tetris project for about an hour, trying to get everything in this little box. Yeah. And it just sort of fit. I had to, I had to grind a little part of the cover off to make it go. But it's a complete 10 gigahertz, 5 watt system. And All uh, you need is 12 volts to come in. You need a, your yeah, IF to come in for two meters, and yeah. out comes five. That's watts. what I work you with, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, he's so we'll loud. Send, he's... We'll send that around. Now, what kind of range are we getting with this stuff? We, we, we've been going up in power as time went on. I mean, I thought it was the greatest thing to get to a watt. I dreamt of that for years, and then I finally got to a watt. And of course, human nature says whatever you do isn't good enough. So I decided to go to 10 watts, and I did not bring that rig with me. Uh, the 10 watt rig, but that's pretty high power on 10 gigs. There is one guy, N9ZL, and probably others who have something like 40 watts and a four foot dish, and uh, and he's loud, but he's down, the, and that's a long way. But this is a rig like Chip has, uh, a DB6NT. Now the problem with these rig, these older versions, is that the frequency of the crystal would drift because it would get hot when you went to transmit. And then it would cool off, so the crystal would cycle up and down. You kind of have to follow each other up and down the band. Sound familiar? That sounds like mine. So, according to W1FKF, you can help to stabilize it by heat sinking it. The reason is that there are 9-volt regulators and stuff soldered onto the sidewalls, and if you can get rid of the heat from those, uh, that helps. And then there's, and there's also a little thing you can clip onto the crystal to help stabilize the temperature, which I did. So all of those things help to improve it. So this is a DB6NT. Now this is a complete unit, including the antenna. Now where's the antenna? Anybody see the antenna? The SMA connector looks like a ground plane. 
at this frequency. It's very close to being a, a quarter wave in, in uh, radius. Uh, and the probe is actually more than a quarter wave. I didn't want to cut it. How far will this work? Anybody, any guesses? Just this alone. You're on the right track. Over 100. Yeah. I've, I've never, I have done a 200, but uh, I, from my house, I've worked Mount Washington with just this. And, and, and uh, when I'm down to Martha's Vineyard, I can work K1TEO, who is a couple hundred kilometers with this. He says, you're kind of weak. You're only S4, S5, you know. Not a lot of gain. Uh, when the signals are really good on the coast, we have this tropo ducting. You can get several hundred miles with something like this. No, we don't. We can't rely on it all the time. It's a, it's, it's something. It's like fishing. It's like the big one that usually gets away. You know, it's something you want to happen but doesn't always happen. And uh, so, say, say you were down on an island uh, like yesterday and it's pouring rain. That would be miserable. But on the other hand, the next day could be beautiful. Now, now, if you want a, a more gain, Dale, you've, you've got one of these. How much gain does that have? Uh, probably six, six or seven, seven eight, 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 six to eight dBi, eight something eight. like that. That's that's not bad. I mean, if that were an HF, six or eight dBi. That'd be like, like a like three a element or four element Miyagi. I have one too, by the way. Hey, look at this. We, we can work each other. We match. Now, I bring this with around. me when I go to these islands because That's the kind of thing to look for in the flea market. If conditions are really, really good, and that dish hears signals really loud. You can tell because when you turn the dish around, you hear it everywhere. When it's that good, I can put the horn on and get people hundreds of miles away with just this. Right, yeah, we were sort of segueing into that. In, yeah, in my, it depends on where you live. In my talk, uh, in my handout, rather, do everybody get a handout? It tells you some of the propagation modes. I'm going to mention... Uh, how many people are familiar with the grid locators? All right. We use this in the contest. We live in FN. FN is the field. This is a field, these big squares. They're not really squares because the earth is curved. This field is 20 degrees wide out of 360 around the world, and it's 10 degrees high, right? That's almost 700 miles high, and probably 100 miles wide is that field. Uh, excuse me, excuse, no, 1,000 miles wide and 700 miles high. Within the field are divided a 10 by 10 grid of numbers, starting with 0, 0 in the corner to 99 at the top. So we're in FN 43, so we're kind of like down here somewhere, right? FN 43, so it's two letters, two numbers, and you can subdivide that further into into even more grids. So here's the FN43 that we're in, right? Right there. You can divide the FN43 into two more, into another grid. So you go two letters, two numbers, and then two letters again. So here are the le letters. They go up to X, A to X, 24 by 24 subgrid. And if that's not good enough, you can divide that into these and then more into these and coins. So every two digits is alternating between letters and numbers. So in the in the contest, we use the six-digit grids. So at home, I'm in FN43 Charlie Delta CD. Here would be somebody east of that. I don't know what, what subgrid that we're in right now. Based on the, the grid that you're in to six digits and the grid the other person is, a computer program will compute the distance and the bearing, and it uses the center of the grid. If that's not good enough, you could subdivide it further. Uh, unfortunately, when we're on Block Island, we're in the eastern part of our grid, so we're actually shortchanging ourselves in distance by a few kilometers. Hopefully, we make contacts with the east to offset that, but guess what? The ocean's there, so we don't work that much. And the same deal on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we're in the eastern part of our subgrid, so we lose some points. Uh, but that's the luck of the draw, right? All right, any questions on the grid thing? By the way, if you lived up near the North Pole, see how the grids get narrower and narrower? They're like pieces of a pie where they all meet. If you really want to do well in a VHF contest, get some dog sled and go around 180 grids or something and just you know work them all. 
get somebody else to stay stationary and then move to the next grid and then work them all again. You get a huge score. <laughs> and guess what? You do this and they change the rules. Right. right? They wouldn't, they'd say, that's cheating. It isn't cheating. It's called ingenuity, right? It's, if somebody was crazy enough to actually do that, you should remember the North Pole was like an ice, ice field. Right? Maybe in Antarctica. <laughs> Maybe in Antarctica. All right, so you had some questions about what you can, distances you can work. Uh, well, before I do that, let me just mention that. I, I'm going to pass a few things more pass around. Pass some things just, around, Chip. Half the fun, yeah, we're hands. <laughs> so we can either do what I did with that one thing and just spend money and buy a complete system, or you can roll your own. And part of the fun, particularly with microwaves, yeah. is building stuff. Yeah. Now there's a filter. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I've made that. I, I don't know where that came from. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've a, got one in my home, my rig that I passed around there. But that, it's a fit. Now the only problem is if you're trying to build stuff for 10 gigahertz, you need a micrometer and darn good eyes and probably a magnifying. Well, I have neither. So so eyes are terrible and. It, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's kind of a fun challenge. Now you know, you, you, instead of spending a lot of money for a filter, here's a filter. You can. Like that. Get the waveguide for a few bucks and, and make a filter if you're patient. That's what I did here. And here's one made out of, if that looks familiar, it's a plumber's pipe cap. Yeah. It's yeah, you, go, you go, to the pipe, go to the store and you can actually make a half inch pipe cap and put two probes in it and you can tune it to 10 gigahertz. You can use it as an image filter. Isn't that neat? So you're talking about what? A couple of bucks to build that thing? Yeah, although now and it might a few be, bucks it more might be for the, now, but it's copper. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, I have some in here. Now this one, remember the crystal has to be multiplied to get up to the 10 gigs? Well, on the way, it's a times two, times three, and so on, to get up 96 times. So some of these pipe caps are bigger because they're working at lower frequency, like three gigs, right? So that's why they're bigger down there. But this is homemade stuff. The preamp is homemade. I don't have a noise figure measuring setup at home, but we do have VHF conferences. We try to go to them, and I bring my stuff, and Chip does too, and we try to get it measured so that we know what the noise figure is and put little labels on it. And we take great pride in getting the lowest noise preamps we can build or buy, you know. That's part of the fun. If you like building stuff, this is for you. But work your way up to it, you know. Don't don't build a 10 gig when you get your license the next day. Yeah. They're they're bandpass filters and they're they're not they're solder sharp. The more screws and tuning things you have, the sharper the skirts on the filter. But the idea is to get rid of the image frequency and the oscillator frequency. So they have a bandwidth of less than one percent, fraction of one percent. You want to get rid of the two unwanted frequencies, the oscillator feed through and the image that's the 144 megahertz below the LO, just like any heterodyne receiver. Some people, by the way, don't use two meter IF like this. They use a 432 IF, which is actually better because it's easier to filter out. Uh, but most people I know use 144. And, and you don't get <laughs> interference if you have 432 IF with a guy next to you who's using a two meter right. we liaison. Use, we use two meters to find people to work. You don't just get on 10 gigs and call CQ. Well, you can, but you shouldn't. Uh, but you you get you raise people on 144.260 sideband, but Unfortunately, that's in the same band as the IF, so they might interfere. That is a problem. Uh, let me show you the antennas here. I use uh, thank you. a two-foot dish at home. Yeah, thank you. And when I go portable, and this is not the same tripod as we bring to the islands now. We've all learned that when you go to some place like that, you have things called rain, wind and rain. And a tripod is a wind catcher with a dish on it, and it can blow over. Uh, so this picture on the cover of QST has this actual setup right here. This was 25 years ago that was taken. What do you think the gain of this dish is? How much gain does it have? Anybody get it? Anybody want to guess besides Mickey, who probably knows? Hint: You can look at your data sheet if you really want to. Yeah, there's a way. Or you can look at the bottom of your sheet, and it tells you what a two-foot dish has. For gain, anybody? 30 T, what's DBI? It's decibels of isotropic. And I was compared to something that radiates equally in all directions, like a sphere. This has a gain of 2,000 or 33 dB compared to that. So it, gain isn't magic. You don't get something for nothing. 
it takes signals away from all the directions you don't want and puts it makes it 2,000 times stronger in this direction, but it has to rob it from every other place. So that's a fairly sharp aiming antenna. It, you have to be within a couple of degrees if the signal's you know, reasonably loud. And if it's really weak, you want to be within plus or minus one degree. So we put a calibration little dial on here with degrees on it. So when you set up, you kind of initially have to calculate or calibrate it. And you can do it by listening to a beacon and then moving the thing so it's that number of degrees that you know the beacon is. Or you can use the sun, the shadow of the sun on the feed, which is what I do in the morning when I first, the sun's rising in September and you have near the equinox. It's going to go up at 90 degrees. And I'm usually within a degree of that. Uh, so there are different ways of doing it. Uh, you also have to worry about the elevation. Not only the azimuth, but the elevation. That's got to be within a degree or so. So if you miss one of those things, you won't find each other. And the other guy's got to do the same thing. So, you, you know, you're, it's, it's two people that could miss each other in the dark. Huh? There's um, probably the ones that we can usually listen to, what, four, five maybe? Maybe, yeah. When I'm on uh, the islands, I think I can easily get four or five. Yeah. And if I can't get the four or five, it's because conditions are lousy, which could happen. And those beacons are a long ways away. I mean, Mount, Mount Washington is off the air. Probably like, forever. But yeah, because uh, they took it down, and, my, and I think it's at WNFKS house. There's one on Mount Mansfield. That's a long ways from us on Martha's Vineyard to here. Uh, and when JEZ has and some of them, there's uh, yeah. um, somebody in Connecticut has one. Mount Greylock, uh, it's got K2CBA's call. He just passed away this past, so I don't know who's who's in charge of that. Um, I can probably pack, find the out. The pack rats have a beacon. The pack rats have a beacon. I usually don't hear it. That's a long, you know, conditions have to be good to hear that. That's a long ways away. But before 9-11, there was a beacon on the World Trade Center. Right. I remember hearing that. I can remember hearing it from Block Island. Now, that's what? It's several hundred miles. Yeah, that's about It was so something. loud, you could, you, could, you could hear it with something like this. Yeah. Because there was some enhancement, tropospheric enhancement. Yeah, I remember hearing that one, yeah. So. And it, it, was, it wasn't that stable. It kind of drifted a little bit. And, but there's one in New Hampshire that you can hear probably from here. It's WA1VVH, Harry, down in Pepperell, Mass. Uh, he's right not far from Nashville, New Hampshire. That is so loud at my house. I've got a 100-foot tower with a 2-foot dish. I can disconnect the BNC cable from the back of my transverter and hold it like that far away and still hear it leaking through the air on two meters. Now that's loud, <laughs> uh, very loud. Now, if you like to go backpacking, this stuff is kind of fun, but you may not want to carry something like this around. So, and a horn is good to have, but if you want something intermediate, they have a, this is a surplus patch antenna. It's like a whole bunch of little circuit board array of dipoles, so if you pick the inside of there. This has a gain of maybe 24 dBi, Sort of in between a horn and a dish. Gunplex is what, 17 dB? 17. 17. The little horn is probably 7 or 8 dB, uh, I or less. And then, so that's kind of intermediate. Uh, so you can pack this and put it in a backpack because it doesn't have depth to it. A big horn that's equivalent to this is going to be deep. Uh, so you've got to figure out what you want to carry with you. But I like playing with stuff, so we try. Uh, you can. Uh, you can. Uh, I mean, like we say, beam forming. Is that what you said? Yes. Uh, just to tell me what you mean by that. Well, it's like crazy. Yeah. Well, that's already it's already being it's already done in there. Okay. I mean, I I could the the inside of this thing is a circuit board with a bunch of etched lines, microscript lines going to each one, so they're all in phase with each other, and uh, it's made to work at 10 gig. But I mean, you could take another one of these patch antennas and combine it and do your own get a bigger antenna, but to me it's not worth the effort. So, but there's loss in the coax lines and so on, so I don't think it's as efficient as a dish of its same size, but it doesn't have as much mass and volume, so it's it's a nice compromise for something in the 20-something dB range. Well, the good news is antennas are relatively easy to come by. <laughs> yeah, they and, are, you know, and like I say... A lot of us use the satellite TV antenna. You're a ham, the word free should mean something. I have about a dozen, at least, of these 18-inch satellite antennas that were given to me by a satellite TV company, and I said, I'll give them out to people. So the offer is there. 
Get a hold of me if you want to come by. I'll give you a dish. How's that? When you say they give them out to you, they don't, they don't charge it? They did not charge me because they had there were surplus dishes they had. I'll, I'll tell you, there were some really good There's deals. A, there was a, a <laughs> furniture store in Barry, Vermont. that went out of business. And I can remember going in there and seeing these kind of Art Deco lights. Gee, that looks a little bit like a parabolic dish. And I think I bought, what, five or six? I sold a bunch here. Yeah. They're 30-inch dishes, and they were well, like nice. 15 or 20 bucks a piece. You know, I, got, I, take, I had to buy the whole light, throw the light fixture away, and <laughs> save the dish. Well, this book here, this guy Richardson, he used snow coasters. Remember the snow sleds that you could slide down? All right, he used those for dishes. And they were 30 inches or so. They're not... Perfect parabolas. That's so. back when they were made out of aluminum. Now they're all plastic. Yeah. yeah. That, oh, that's another thing you can do is you can make you can use a Fresnel lens. Now a Fresnel lens at 10 gigs is kind of big, and the gratings would be kind of big. But you could do things like that. In fact, Paul Wade made a lens antenna out of styrofoam and aluminum foil. Remember those? And he stuck them in front of these horns and increased the gain several dB. And I tried that myself. W1GHC is Paul. He's a neighbor of mine. Yeah, he's a neighbor. You Chip. can tell from his call sign where his interest lies. Yeah, he, and he writes the, the microwave column in QST. It's every other month. It's mentioned in the handout, by the he's way. He's a good source. Yeah, and uh, he uh, has an antenna handbook that you can look up. It's mentioned on here, and it's got all kinds of ideas from himself and other people about all kinds of stuff like that. So this is experimenters' paradise. This stuff. He's now, doing a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, Oh, I, yeah, I do. I do, I do uh, HF, and so does Chip. Yeah, I'm on 160 meters. What I haven't done yet, and I say yet, is the new bands at 600 meters and 2200 meters. Guess what? The same kind of people. They like listening to weak signals, bury in the noise, and pretend there's somebody there. Right? In other words, the harder you have to work to hear a signal, the more challenging it is. And the, yeah, right, you need space. But I mean, the same kind of people, they don't want to just get on and make easy contacts. I mean, I can get on 20 meters and so can Chip and talk to people in Europe all day at home, and we do. But this is technically challenging because DX, which means distance, on these frequencies is not thousands of miles, it's probably hundreds of miles. And if you could make a contact over a thousand miles, it would be very noteworthy. It is possible. Uh, Mickey and I have worked W4DEX more than once from both Block Island and Martha's Vineyard. You, did you work him? I Dexter? did that from Block Island. Now you were on the Vineyard, so I was on both. you so have I, the record. Yeah, I have. Well, anyways, from Block Island, I set the world's record on range scatter by working him in North Carolina. That's 1,100 kilometers. Uh, it's exciting stuff. Have you done EMP? Um, Not on this band, but I've done it on three other bands. I've done it on 144. So has Chip done it on, believe it or not, 432 and 902 megahertz, which not many people have done. I have yet to do it on 1296, but Chip can tell you about 1296 EME. On which band? You do 1296 EME. Yeah. Yeah, so Chip is on 1296. We haven't done 10 gigs. Uh, That's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit of a challenge because you need a somewhat bigger dish than that. You need some power, which I don't have. Traveling wave tube amplifiers come to mind if you want real power. Surplus tube type things with thousands of volts on them. And you've got to follow the moon, which moves 15 degrees an hour. So when you've got a, a dish that has to be within a fraction of a degree, you've got to keep moving that thing to find the signal. And there's Doppler shift. And at 10 gigahertz, when this moon's relative to the Earth is moving, the Doppler shift could be 30 kilohertz. So you've got to know where people are on the dial. There's a lot of stuff to it. Uh, there are some people that do it. I, my recommendation is kind of work your way up. Do it on an easier band, like two meters, and kind of work your way up. I haven't got to 10 gig EME yet. Not that I don't want to. But will I be alive, alive long enough to do all the things I want to do? But you know, Dale, there's something for everybody. Yep. I mean, if you want to get started simple and easy, the you can do like a wideband gun flexor. <laughs> if you want to go to narrow band, you'll get more activity and narrower, yeah, yeah, you know. Right. But 
EMA is not for everybody, but it's there if you want to do it. It's ultimate DX. If you want to work snow scatter, this is New England, so it's snow scatter yeah. six months of the year. You can do it. You can do rain scatter when there's a rain cloud in the right spot. So there's a lot of, a lot of interesting challenges beyond just chatting with your neighbor down the street. Well, somebody asked a question about going beyond line of sight. There's a little paragraph called propagation here. Yeah. And uh, the gunplexers, the, not most of the stuff we've done, in fact, all of it we've done, is pretty much line of sight. And in New England, of course, you get trees, and they don't like to uh, pass 10 gig signals. They're pretty opaque to that stuff. But once we went to sideband, a whole new world opened up for us. And uh, CW and sideband, uh, this is a good reason to learn code, because some of these signals are weak. Uh, and you can always start out on code, and if it's loud, you can switch over to voice. But we have uh, tropospheric scatter. And you know, when the sun sets, you still see the glow at dawn and dusk of the sun. Why is that? You can't see the sun, but why do you see the glow? It's particles. It's scat yeah. The light is scattered. So even beyond the horizon, you're going to get some of it. The same thing happens at radio frequencies. And we take advantage of that. You can go beyond the visual horizon with, with 10 gigahertz by using scatter. And when you've got a good enough equipment, the reliable range is quite a ways. It can be 100 or more miles, you know, yeah. easily, easily. But sometimes you have enhanced tropospheric conditions. And uh, on the coast, you really notice that. You have ducting with temperature inversions and layers of uh, warm and cold air mixing together and producing like a duct or a, or a waveguide path. And the best kind of ducting is what's called super refraction, where the signals actually follow the curvature of the Earth. And uh, I've never experienced that beyond several hundred miles, but a lot of times from Block Island in Martha's Vineyard, you will have signals going down to Virginia in North Carolina on the coast, right? The Earth is eight, eight inches per mile. Yeah, it's eight inches per mile. That's a good thing to know. And sometimes, rarely, you can have an inland. And we've got a couple rare ones. We were able to get guys in Canada beyond the Great Lakes. Uh, one day we were getting a guy in North Carolina, and the other day we were getting these guys in Canada. And some of them were running low power, like a couple hundred milliwatts, you know, and we're able to work. It's very amazing, and it doesn't happen all the time. And I've done this on other bands, too. You know, I worked Michigan from my house on two gigs with, with half a watt. Question? Yes, sir. How does the tracking for aircraft scatter work? Aha. Uh, good, good question. Where, you've got to have patience. But before I mention the aircraft, a little bit easier to do is called rain scatter and snow scatter. And there's a guy, K0SM, who we work in the contest, who came up with a program for that. And the idea is you get a radar map on your computer and you look at the storms that are possible, like the ones that are 40,000 feet up. And if you get one of those storms that's 200 miles from you and you get another 200 miles to another station, you can both hit the rain cloud and some of the signal will scatter and bounce back to Earth. And if you're in line, you get the most. If you're 90 degrees off, you get nothing. But uh, that happens quite a bit. And the rainstorms are moving slow enough when they're 200 miles away that you can track it and follow it and carry on a conversation for a long time. And you can do that with aircraft, but it's not right, as right. easy. Right. The aircraft is the same idea, except the airplanes are moving. And you know, you're, it's a very small area you're hitting on the plane. Uh, in the last contest in September, I worked K0SM by doing that. We got lucky. If you ever done, um, what do you call it, meteor scatter on two meters? You ever done that? Or have you read about it? Well, the idea is you hit a meteor trail that's moving. Guess what? You've got to be pretty fast because these planes could be right above the horizon 200 miles away for a matter of seconds and then go away. And you... If you do it hit or miss, which is what I did, you may get a plane and you just keep sending the information over and over again until another one goes through. If you're in a corridor of airplanes, like coming out of New York City or something, you might have one coming off. And so this guy, W3SZ, came up with the aircraft scatter program, and he actually can predict what planes are going over what path and where they are. So you can look that up. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I've had a lot of time in track in A380, you know, going overhead. 
probably are. You probably are. If you want, to, it, it, statistically, that probably would be better. Or you could wait for the Goodyear blimp, or I don't know. But, uh, but, yeah. The problem is how how old are you and how long you want to wait. You know? <laughs> we're in a contest, so we're trying to work. I'm trying to work K0SM. So he's 500 and something kilometers away. He's right at the edge of Trumpo scatter, you know, and he can hear him weakly, and then. An airplane comes by, and suddenly the signal just pops right out of the noise. <laughs> and, the, and, I, and, and, and the trick is to do it quickly, because I'm using Morse code with a straight key, you know. And, and that was kind of neat. Unfortunately, Mickey did not work him, because he didn't get the final stuff, because we had to wait for another airplane to come by. And he didn't, he didn't get her final part of the report, the Rogers. And Roger means I received everything. And it didn't count, so I got like one contact that she didn't get. It was hit or miss, you know. We just kept trying. You've got to be patient to do that kind of stuff. This is not for people who want instant gratification. Right. You may or may not get. If you're lucky. If you're reasonably patient, you can do well. We should leave some time for questions because we're almost we're done almost here. We're almost there. But but anyways, there's, that's an thing. So look up those programs. Uh, was there another type of propagation that's in Oh, bouncing off of things. Um, there are people that you're blocked from. Sometimes you aim at a common object, like another mountain, that you can both see or you can work each other. Or a water tower. There's one guy at N1GJ. His water tower is five miles from his house. He aims at that and I aim at it. We can work each other, but not direct. So there's all this neat stuff like that you can learn. From. Now, there's one thing you didn't mention. Probably a lot of things. And I think you've experienced it. We're operating 10 gigahertz usually on mountains in New England drive up mountains unless you really want to backpack up. So that means you're going to have a lot of people up there who are not hands. What are yeah. you doing? Are you shooting eagles? Uh, are you tracking whales? So yeah. somebody, not me, put together a, what's going on, and I, I made my own little And I got my handout. version of it. Well, in fact, I'm going to pass this around. But this th is, here's the secret that I've found. This is for the public. If you want to work 10 gigahertz, and you're busy making a contact, you don't want to really drop everything and talk to someone, but you don't want to be rude. And I've found the most effective thing is to find someone, preferably, since I'm a guy, a young lady, and she doesn't even have to be a ham, and she just hands the hand out, and somebody says, what are you doing? And talk to this lady here. And even if she's not a ham, she goes, well, it's a contest, and it's microwaves, and He'll be free in a minute to give you the details. Well, I have but Mickey. Be prepared. People will ask a lot of questions. Mickey even goes out. Uh, wait, we have a lot of tourists on Martha's Vineyard, you know. And Mickey will offer these people to take their picture on their phone and all kinds of stuff like that. Say, would you like a picture? And, they, and they're friendly to us, you know. And, and she explains what's going on. And we get a lot of positive stuff. And a lot of hams or would-be hams say, oh, this is interesting. Somebody saw me make the, the airplane scatter contact on code and thought that was the neatest thing. So they're, they're, they're the lighthouse people are looking forward to seeing us again next year. Now, that makes you feel good when something like that happens. It's a positive ham radio thing. Any more questions here? We'll stick around. I, I'm not going to pass this whole book around, but there are pictures here from my, some of my operations, not just microwave. And yes, I did send a letter to myself, the house with all the antennas in Cabot, Vermont. And it was in my mailbox when I got home. <laughs> I have a very friendly postman. All right. All right. Any, We'd uh, be delighted to see some of you on any microwave band, but think of 10 gigahertz. It's kind of fun. Yeah, and uh, talk try, to Dale. He's, he, try to get the chip he'll tell you how to get board. on the band. Anybody got my gun flexor who's back here, maybe? All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We need we need people on these bands. Use it or lose it. Ah, thanks. Yeah. Alrighty.